Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Thomas Fagun. I have 23 years experience in the fiduciary industry, uh, and I've also acted as a private wealth management for a number of years. So today I would like to share with you practical information um, about using your financial position as a multi-million business. So um, I'm going to try to make it as practical as possible, but please remember that it's not possible to make you trust experts in such a short period of time. So I'm going to share with you the information. Um, and the important thing is that you'd realize at the end of the presentation that your personal financial position is a business and you need to regard it as such. So the theme of my presentation is to trust or not to trust. That is the question. There's so much information out there that leaves people confused. They don't know whether it's a good thing to use a trust in financial planning or not. But at, I hope by sharing with you the practical examples that you will be able to make up your own mind as far as that is concerned. So let's look at a practical example. And this is a, a very uh, run of the mill type of estate whereby the first dying spouse leaves his entire estate to the surviving spouse. And upon the demise of the surviving spouse, they bequeath everything to the children. So let's say this estate was worth 19 million rand. Here comes the shock. People don't realize that there is an inflationary effect involved um, in your estate. So look, let's look at a particular example. The total expenses uh, combining of executives, fees, capital, and tax and debt and conveyancing fees amount to 3.3 million rand. And then we have to add the estate duty liability, which amounts to 5,088,000. So um, it's quite a substantial amount of the original estate of about 19 million rand. 5 million rand is gone. And that's the penalty you pay for being ignorant. Paying estate duty and and cetera is not compulsory at all. People has got the misnomer that um, uh, estate duty liability is payable in any event. But that's the that's the amount you pay for being ignorant. It's a completely voluntary tax. And I would like to share with you how to really regard your personal financial position as a business. So let's look at this particular scenario um, of what the solution would be. It's inevitable for you to have assets in your own personal estate. So we normally keep your personal residence, um, your vehicles and your pension fund, you don't have any choice as far as that is concerned in your own personal estate. So that's um, our growth assets, um, but by, by means of the rules of estate planning, it's inevitable to have some assets in your own personal estate. The main important thing is that your growth assets should be invested in legal entities such as trust and companies, etc. So if we compare the scenario, in the blue scenario, uh, the inflationary effect only amounts to about 200,000 Rand. Um, compared to the first scenario of 5,088,000, which is quite a substantial amount. So, um, and that's just by looking at your financial position as a business and involving proactive estate planning in as, as a business strategy. So what pe people should know is that your personal financial position is a business. Your business is not what you do between nine and five. Your business is what you do with that money that you earn from a nine to five position or as a property investor, whatever the case might be. You should look at it holistically and not look at property individually or at investment individually. You should look at the business in its entirety. So when is it useful to make use of a trust in your financial planning? If, if any one of the following um, reason appeals to you, um, a trust would certainly be a useful tool. So if you want to leave a legacy for your children and your grandchildren, if you want to protect your assets from creditors or in case of a boss, uh, if you want to minimize the inflationary effect like we've seen in the previous slides, um, and to make um, sure that when you are mentally or disabled, or in case of the mice, your family is taken care of. If any one of these reasons appeal to you. A trust is a financial tool in, to be used in your financial planning. So the type of trust that we use in financial planning is called a discretionary trust. It's not a vesting trust. It's not a testamentary trust. And I will explain to you in the following slide what a discretionary trust is. 
A tr discretionary trust basically is a trust where the assets are vested in the trustees of the trust, and they can just exercise their discretion as and when they see fit to make a distribution to a beneficiary of the trust. It can either be, they can they have a discretion in terms of when they want to make the distribution, how much they want to distribute, and to which beneficiaries they want to make a distribution. So the trust is also set up during the lifetime of the founder and not, for example, in a world. What can you not do with the trust? You cannot act unilaterally as a trustee of the trust because it's not your assets. And you can also not bequeath the trust assets in your will because once again, it's not your assets. As a, as a trustee of the trust, you can exercise your discretion to acquire properties, to buy property, to sell property, to make investments, to liquidate investments, um, and to employ people or um, uh, apply for bonds, or whatever the case might be. In the next slide, we'll look at what you cannot do with trust assets. Um, unfortunately, because of the nature of a trust and financial products, um, you can not use trust assets to invest in retirement products, for example, retirement annuities, pension fund, or provident fund, because the trust is not a natural individual that it can retire. You can also not um, invest directly offshore uh, because of exchange control regulations, but you can invest offshore by means of an asset swap arrangement. So, and you can also not gamble with trust assets. We had this particular classical case of somebody winning the lotto, uh, quite, quite a substantial amount, and they said the money should be paid out into the trust bank account because the trust purchased a ticket, and it was refused because of the simple fact that part of your fiduciary duty as a trustee is to act in the best interest of the trust. And gambling is not regarded as one of those duties. So you cannot buy a lot of tickets with trust money. So how do you get assets into the trust? There are three ways of getting assets into the trust, which basically involves using your annual donations tax allowance to put 100,000 Rand into the trust per taxpayer. So that's 100,000 Rand for every spouse. And if you, Kids have the finances, they can also do the same, but you cannot donate 100,000 Rand to your kids and then use your 100,000 Rand to put it into the trust because you've used your 100,000 Rand the national tax allowance uh, when, you, when you donated money to your kids. So um, you can also leave bequest to the trust in your will. So one of the first things that we do when somebody sets up a trust is that we redraft their will and bequeath assets from the estate to the trust. And also, if you know that your parents has got quite a substantial estate, you can ask them to change their will. And instead of you inheriting a particular amount, you can ask them to change their will and let your inheritance pass straight into the trust. And then also um, making use of low interest bearing loans to the trust. We'll look at that in the next slide. So that basically involves a person uh, below the age of 65. There's a complete uh, calculation of the full amount. Um, so when you are below the age of 65, you can basically make an interest fee loan or a low interest loan to the trust at a, of about 500,000 Rand. And if you are above the age of 65, that will amount to 850,000 Rand. As a trustee of most of my clients' trust, I normally keep tabs of what that loan amount should be. So don't break your head too much about how the calculation is made. Um, I will uh, make sure that we stay within the limits. How do you get assets out of the trust? Normally, when the trustees exercise their discretion, they can decide to make a capital distribution to a particular beneficiary. Uh, they can also in, distribute interest that the trust into uh, income beneficiary of the trust. Um, and remember in the previous slide, we said that you can make a loan to the trust. So at a particular stage in future, uh, the trustees can decide to repay that loan that you made to the trust. Um, and then also um, the trust can make loans to the beneficiary of the trust during the lifetime of that beneficiary. Um, and is not repaid during its lifetime. It's only paid back um, by the executor of that person's um, deceased estate eventually. And that's normally by means of a life cover buyout. 
So if you look at a suggestion of how you should structure your estate, so you'll not never have, or, or, sorry, pardon, you'll have a private trust and a property trust and a property company, for example. This is just a suggestion and it will change depending on the needs of the particular client. So normally in the private trust, you'll have um, cash growth assets or unfinanced growth assets. The property trust is for financed growth assets. And then obviously the property company is for your uh, property portfolio, but we'll look in the next slide of what goes where exactly. So in the private trust, you will have your cash, your life cover, shares, and your valuable coins. In the property trust, you'll have your buy to lets and your long-term key properties. Properties that you would speculate with or your buy to sells will be in the property company itself. And there's very complicated legal reasons why we do it that way. Um, and I will be able to explain this to you um, uh, individually uh, if a need arises. So people always ask me, but what happens to my vehicles, my furniture, and my personal use at, uh, items? Since the, these assets do not increase in value, I would not recommend putting them into the trust. So let's look at the vehicle, for example. Let's say the vehicle is worth a million rand today. If you transfer that asset to the trust by means of a loan account, two years later, that vehicle will only be worth 500,000 rand but the loan individual originally was 1 million rand. So it doesn't make sense to transfer assets that depreciates in value into the trust. We only use the, the legal entities for assets that increases in value. So how does the trust generate wealth? Um, number one, the capital appreciation of the assets, uh, the refinancing of the equity in the property, the surplus rental income, um, and the cash conversions pay out from a discovery contract. Um, and then also the, the growth of your investments in the private trust, for example, with Alan Gray as an asset manager. So the golden rule with a trust is that you should always have a paper trail of each and every trust transaction, um, whether it be a resolution, a loan agreement, or a deed of donation, or a contract, just have some sort of a paper trail confirming that trust transaction. Now, the reason why that is quite important is for the following. Um, if you uh, acquire um, an asset um, um, and eventually you, um, you, you pass away and there's not a paper trail confirming that this asset was actually a trust transaction, then that asset will be regarded as an asset in your own personal estate. But if there was a resolution stipulating that the trustees exercise their discretion and acquired the asset in the trust, then that is prima facie proof that this was actually a trust asset. Um, and then one important factor when you draft the resolution is that you must always refer to a clause in the trust deed that gives you the permission or the authority to enter into that particular transaction. So it's, the trust deed is the constitution of that legal entity. So you must always move within the constitution of that legal entity. So a quite uh, prominent topic that comes up when you talk about trust is that people want to know about this, this tax commission and that tax commission, what is the future of trust? Now, um, I've been involved in forums since uh, the year 2000. So if anything would happen as far as that is concerned, so we would know uh, ahead of time uh, what that particular um, situation would be. But I can tell you um, up front that the worst thing that can happen to trust in the future is that, like for example, I have in Malta that there's a law against perpetuity and every number of years a trust would have to dissolve and the assets distributed to the beneficiaries. So that's the worst thing that can happen to trust in South Africa. Uh, but as far as uh, I'm aware of, there is no such uh, arrangements in the pipeline. Um, and you must remember, as far as tax is concerned, a trust has got a discretionary nature. So when tax laws change, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to know what tax, tax laws would be in five years, let alone 10 years from now. But the discretionary nature of a trust enables the trustees of the trust to exercise their discretion at a particular stage in future 
to make decisions in the prevalent tax environment. So as far as that's concerned, so since we use a discretionary trust, I'm not concerned about the changes in tax law um, because the trustees can exercise their discretion in the future and decide how they want to how, to, how they want to deal with that particular issue. The main, uh, the main important thing is that uh, if a trust is made mandatory to dissolve every number of years, that can certainly have a profound impact on the usefulness of trust in the future. So um, that's an introduction in terms of trust law. Um, the, here are my contact details. You can also get this from uh, TJ. Um, and I believe we have a num we, ha we have a question and answer session now. You, Thomas, <laughs> that was an, that was a, a very, very interesting um, 15 minutes, but yes. I want us to, it, it was like, it felt to me like, you have so many numbers, but I want us to take it a step back, okay? Sure. Especially from people that are completely new in trust, okay? Yes. So when I started, for me, it was like, okay, so there's a company. A company mm -hmm. has directors and shareholders. And I figured out that, Googled it, I figured out, oh, it's easy. I can just go on to CIPC, I click a few buttons, and whoop, I have a company. Yes. But I tried to do that with trust, and that didn't really work the same way. Yes. So yes. how do you actually go about creating a trust what are the entities or the, the, the role players in a trust mm -hmm. and how do you actually set it up? Yes, cool. Listen, I, I must first just compliment you. You make it look like this electronic medium is so natural to me. It's quite strange because I'm used to seeing people's faces <laughs> in front of me. So, yeah, I want to compliment on you on your style. It's really very relaxed. Yeah, I, I must just make a correction. I think TJ informed you incorrectly. I wasn't the professor. I was a guest oh. lecturer at the University of Pretoria. Oh, that's the same my... thing, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I wouldn't want to be a professor. Thank goodness. The, the industry is so alive, so it's much nicer. Sure. Yeah, so, so thank you very much for that a very uh, valid question. Um, so basically, as far as the trust is concerned, you've got three role players. The first person who establishes the trust is called the founder of the trust. Um, and I, I must just mention... I think the trust law in South Africa is quite difficult to understand because it originated in Scandinavian law originally. So in South Africa, we've got Roman Dutch law and English law as a hybrid system, but it actually originated in, um, in the Scandinavian countries, uh, countries with William the Conqueror, etc. So that was introduced to English law, and then that became part of South African law, basically with the arrival of the settlers in 1820. So it's not... It's not, um, yeah, it's not common law um, at all to understand. But um, uh, once you get introduced to it and you see how it works, you realize, oh my goodness, it's actually very, it's very simple. So mm -hmm. uh, as far as the founder is concerned, that person would just um, negotiate with me how to get the trust uh, set up and, and et cetera. But once the trust is actually established, the role of the founder really falls away. That person's got no influence on the trust uh, anymore. Normally what happens is that the founder is normally one of the trustees, So, but then it puts on the hand as a trustee and then he fulfills a role as a trustee in the future. Now, what's quite interesting is that the trust will own the asset, but since it's not a natural individual, the trustees fulfill the function of the incumbents of that particular entity. So they will in future be the most important part of the trust uh, and they will make the decisions. They will decide what to buy, what to sell and the type of transactions that the trust would be involved in. And then thirdly, you get the beneficiaries of the trust. Now, um, you must remember that since we're trying to work with multiple generations, the beneficiaries in the trust is indicated by means of category. So it will be, for example, the founder and his wife and the children and the grandchildren and anybody in their blood lineage. Because the thing is, we don't even know what the situation is going to be with your family five years from now. So now we're talking about generations. So that's why yeah. it's important that we use, uh, mm -hmm. we don't know what your grandchildren are going to be called. 
um, and ideally because of um, uh, court cases, um, uh, I would never amend the beneficiaries in a trust. So if you sometimes you get trust deed that the, the persons are A, B, C, and D, and that's it. Um, and then a few years later on, they would try to amend the, the trustee to change the, the names of the beneficiary of the trust. That is incredibly dangerous because what people don't realize is that even though you are a beneficiary of the trust, so let's say, for example, I'm a beneficiary of your trust. I can't come to you and say, look, Rieta, I'm a beneficiary of the trust. Give me 10,000 rand. And believe you me, the reason why I'm getting involved in litigation is because unfortunately there's a lot of ignorance out there whereby uh, beneficiaries know that there's a lot of money in a, in a parent's trust and now they claim money from the trust. If you are a beneficiary of the trust, it's just a discretionary beneficiary. So you can't come to the, uh, the trustees and claim a benefit. It's only when the trustees exercise their discretion and they decide they want to give this beneficiary X amount of money at a particular stage in future, then they can mm -hmm. actually do so. But before they exercise their discretion and sign that resolution passing the ownership of that asset to the beneficiary, the beneficiary does not have any vested interest on trust assets or in trust assets. Now, why is that important? And believe you me, I've seen in 23 years, I've, quite, I've seen quite a number of examples. So um, you work hard, you accumulate a lot of wealth in your trust, your daughter gets married, incumbent to your property without knowing uh, any better, and she gets divorced. Now, then a divorce spouse would come out and say, but look, um, I know my wife was a beneficiary of this trust. Uh, I need a distribution. There is no such thing unless there was a discretionary uh, discretion exercised by the trustees and a benefit given to that daughter, um, then there is no benefit for the divorced spouse. So um, mm -hmm. and that's so also when we make a distribution to that particular daughter as a beneficiary, we stipulate that this is her exclusive asset. So even though she was incorrectly married in community of property, that will still remain her personal asset um, as far as the, the um, uh, separation of a future estate would be. So it's nice that when we deal with a, um, uh, at, at category by name, that in 50 years from now, when the original trust is too big and there's too many beneficiaries, you can split up the original trust into separate trusts for the new core family groups. So you can't do that, for example, with, with a company. So because the shares are owned by a particular person, you can't split up a company eventually without having large expenses. But what yeah. we can do with the trust is that with the discretionary nature, the trustees can say, okay, but now we've got 50 beneficiaries. So let's rather take the capital in the original private trust and split that up into four trusts for each um, uh, uh, central uh, um, beneficiary. So you can split it up into, into smaller groups. And it's merely just, one trust splits up into five trusts with no um, particular legal complications. It's very simple to do that. So you can oh. split one private trust up into se separate entities without, uh, without adverse, um, because when I, when I draw off the trustee, the future trust is already set up as a potential beneficiary um, of the original trust. So that's why there's no complications. Mm. Because, okay. I, because from experience, I know what happens 50 years down the line. So we need to split up the trust and just split up uh, the um, assets from the private trust into future private trust for the individual um, family members. Uh, one thing that I would also just to reiterate is that we normally have two trusts, the private trust, which is your cash assets, and then the trust where your finance assets are kept. That's, that's the red trust in the circle. Um, so, so, um, so basically, the private trust is the most important entity in the whole in the whole setup, because that's where all your cash assets lie. I normally, in my presentations, I use the example uh, of somebody going to Woolworths trying to buy food and saying, "Look, I've got 50 million rands for the property. Give me food." They're going to have you certified very quickly and dragged out by a security guard uh, because you need cash to fund your lifestyle. So what's very important in the whole strategy is that we have to realize that property is the asset class where your wealth is created, but that asset class is a conduit pipe for that cash to go into your private trust. So in a worst case scenario, for example, um, there's a big recession, uh, the uh, interest rate goes up to 20% and you can't afford your property anymore and they are sold, the entities will basically be either sequestered or liquidated. 
but the cash lying in your private trust, nobody can touch that cash. So, mm. um, and that's why it's very important that we that we focus on keeping your cash separate and not expose your cash assets to the risk of property the uh, property portfolio, whether that be speculation, loan them keeps or rental, whatever the case might be. Your cash in the private trust will always be protected. Yeah. All right. Okay. Cool. So basically, then, when when you talk about the trust, so there's a there's a trust deed, and yes. you you set that up with the founder. The founder will say, okay, well, these are all my beneficiaries. This is the purpose. This is what I want to do with this trust. Um, and, and these then are the trustees, yes. Them. Yeah, and these are the trustees. But then, so in the beginning, I was, I, I, there's always this thing about an independent trustee. How does that yes. work? And who is an yeah. independent trustee? Yeah. You see, the thing is, um, um, that is unfortunately been something that's that's been a bit abused by the fiduciary industry. So, um, but I will explain that to you as well. Um, it's basically required by the master of the high court um, that uh, because the uh, the master of the high court are inundated with uh, beneficiaries fighting with with trustees. So the master said no, um, uh, and I think it's about um, since about three years ago. So when you uh, submit a trustee, the master will always ask who is the independent trustee because that person is not a so an independent trustee means that that person is not a beneficiary of the trust so he can never uh, acquire any benefit out of the out of the trust um, by any by any means so all that means is that when you have got three trustees and normally it's a good idea to have three trustees so it will be the, the founder and his wife for example and as their children uh, um, reach majority age uh, of 18 years old, they can also be assumed as additional trustee. So what happens is the role of the professional trustee or the independent trustee, which is normally in 99% of the cases, it will be myself, um, because the trustees don't have any experience in terms of managing a trust or how the law works. or, um, to, uh, or they don't, it, it, It's not skills that you acquire naturally. You have to get these skills through exposure. So the independent trustee is normally there to make sure that the admin is done and that the trust is run compliant with legal um, requirements. So, um, um, and in my particular case, I don't charge my client a monthly um, uh, trustee's fee. It's only when I, in, I get involved in drafting a resolution or making a decision for the trust that I build the client for the transaction at that particular stage in time. Um, I feel it's a bit unethical to charge um, uh, a passive fee monthly for not doing anything. Uh, so I only charge my client a fee when I actually draft um, a resolution or uh, uh, I make it, uh, give advice, whatever the case might be. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay, cool. So basically then, so you can have as many trustees as you want. There's no limit to, or there's no maximum amount. Although obviously for logistical reasons, you don't want too many people in it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing is people, um, I would normally recommend three because remember every time you have to sign a resolution, we have to do a round robin for all the trustees to sign the resolution. So if you've got 20 trustees, which sounds wonderful in your trustee, but it's an admin nightmare. So, mm. um, so I would not recommend that, but um, so you need at least two trustees, which one of them would have to be the independent trustee. Um, then obviously the, the founder can be a trustee as well. Um, and normally it's his spouse. And as the children reach majority age, they are assumed as additional trustees. The reason why that is important is that, uh, 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 or the reason why I like to use um, the clients, uh, children of majority age as co-trustees is that this is a family business. Um, and the skills in managing this business is basically transferred from one generation to the next. So if the kids yeah. are trustees, they would know exactly what, how this business runs. So if, for example, um, um, you are a vet and you're married and you've got three kids, you earn a lot of money as a vet. And believe you me, I've seen the people in South Africa that earns most money are the veterinarians. They earn <laughs> enormous amounts of money. So I'm trying to get my daughter who's 11 years old to be a veterinarian, but I don't think she's going to go that route. Um, but so for example, now your kids are older. They are now doctors or property investors or whatever the case might be. So then they know how the business runs. So they can be any profession. But the real business is at the end of the day is what do you do with the money that you earn? And the purpose mm. of this business is to convert income into capital assets. So as they are uh, incorporated as trustees, they would know how the business um, 
basically works and they transfer that skills to the next generation and to the next generation. So uh, what I've, what I've um, learned in the industry is that um, once kids know, knows what to do with their wealth, it gives them a sense of purpose. So yeah. they know they are, they, that they accumulate wealth for generations to come. And um, so the mentality changes from, um, and you know, there's this uh, saying that clocks, clocks to clocks in three generations. One generation works hard for the wealth, the next generation are accustomed to the wealth, and the third generation has to start from scratch again. So, um, <laughs> yeah, no, unfortunately, we want to avoid that, works. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how it works. So, fortunately, when they are exposed to the business model, they know that every generation contributes to the wealth. So, mm. the, the more generations contribute to the wealth, the stronger the uh, position of wealth would be in the third and the fourth generation. Um, and, you know, um, coming from the fiduciary industry as well, um, I've seen how the inflationary uh, in, uh, impact on a state, like we've looked at the example. Um, um, I mean, in that particular example, if you um, had 5 million rand uh, assets investable for the next generation, can you imagine what that 5 million rand would be, would be worth 15 years down the line? But because of ignorance, that 5 million rand is gone down the tubes. Um, and at least so... Uh, the more then the generations grow in terms of the strategy, the more the exponential effect is of the of the wealth creation. Yeah, and I think also people, you know, when we go back to that number of trustees, what people have to realize is that that paper trail that you spoke about in the yes. uh, your presentation. I mean, for me, that is that is crucial because you never yes. anything that you want to do, anything that you want to pay or move or if you want to open a bank account you need to get a resolution done now yes. imagine you have to just to get approval to open a bank account yes uh, you now have to get 20 people to sign a exactly. document proving yes. that i'm crazy yes which yeah. is why it's better to to have but i also and the other comment i want to make is that i really love this idea of you know my initial thought when you said your kids become trustees, I'm like, hell no, <laughs> they're going to waste that money. But on the other hand, um, yeah. it's actually it's actually such a nice way to to bring them in so that they can also see the work that goes into creating that, that yeah. uh, the process of doing it, how it gets yes. done, and, yes. and really understand their responsibility as the custodian of that for their children. Absolutely. At Absolutely. No, yeah, I think that's is, a tool like yeah, that. I yeah. thought of, of to do it like that. Yeah. You see, the reason what what I found in practice is that if kids don't have a sense of purpose, then they would go out and spend the money. Mm -hmm. But if they mm -hmm. are involved with every transaction from the beginning, they know how difficult it was to earn that money to accumulate that wealth. So, so money's the sense of of wealth is. Is, 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 is very important to, to establish that with your kids. And they only get that through uh, exposure. If they just see one day there's lots of money, they don't know where the money came from. But the, if they are involved as trustees, and you know, I've had clients who had their 18 year old kids involved in the very uh, first meeting where the trust was set up. And so, um, so they, they don't have to be trustees eventually. As a beneficiary, you can tell them, look, this is a trust set up with you as a beneficiary, but this is how the business works. It's just that when they become trustees eventually, they they actually now are in a position of authority, um, yeah. and they um, and they they um, and uh, uh, funny enough, with a sense of authority comes the responsibility as well. So and uh, um, so quite often people say, yeah, but I want to give my kids lots of money. I think that's the wrong attitude to have. You have to give your kids the skills. So if they've got the skills, they would be yeah. able to. Um, contribute to the wealth as well. Uh, sorry, I just want to mention one more thing that um, I wrote a question while the presentation was going on. Um, so you mentioned um, initially that sometimes you set up a company and sometimes you set up a trust. If you set up a yeah. company without a trust, that makes no sense to me whatsoever. Because if you set up a company and you accumulate the wealth in that company, but you own the shares in that company, guess what's going to happen when you die? All of those company assets... Um, the shareholding in that company is an asset in your estate, and you can still pay executive fees and estate duty on uh, on that fee. So when you have a company, you cannot have a company without the trust, because the shares in the company should be owned by the trust. 
So a trust is always essential. Whether you add companies to that is where mm. you've got the, the choice to do. But, you know, sometimes I see a client, you know, I set up this company, I've got all my properties in the company, 10 million rands with the property, I ask them, but do you own shares in the company? No, I do. So what did you achieve? Absolutely nothing. So you still have got the risk of ownership of the shares in the company. So the shares yeah. of the company should always lie in a trust. So and normally I use the private trust for that um, because there's no risk attached to the private trust. So if I own the shares in a property trust and the property trust goes insolvent, the shares in the company would be uh, a detriment. So we normally keep the shares in the in the company in the private trust because there's no risk in the in the private trust whatsoever. All right. Okay. Awesome. Um, and then I think my 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 next question before we can go to because I see uh, we're getting quite a, a lot of questions coming in, which is really awesome. So from my side, I think the last one um, that I also for setup uh, purposes, if you take it back to the sort of grassroots, um, I was quite surprised when I did my first trust on on how long it takes and the yes. process. You can't just go onto a website and it's done. Yes. Um, how long does it take and, and what are the steps that you have to really follow yeah. Uh, yeah. to get it? Yeah. So listen, um, you must remember that during COVID, we are not in ideal circumstances and it, it makes my life absolutely hell at this stage because um, I've got no control over the process. So um, when a client, I, I basically got an interview with the client and the client tells me, okay, these are going to be the trustees and the beneficiaries. Um, it takes me literally a week to draft the documents, get it signed, and then I have to prepare the deeds for lodging at the master of the high court. Now, Currently, you're not allowed to see anybody in the master's office. And I completely understand why, because you must remember that people who, who perished due to COVID have to report, their families have to report those who stayed to the master of the high court. So they're very sensitive of being in contact with the members of the public because of the high risk exposure to COVID. So, so what uh, basically happens is that you have to uh, put the documents in a box at the master's office. Nobody signs for it. And then eventually they come and collect it and then they go through the whole process and then you have to wait until they correspond with you. There's no system, unfortunately, that's working well. So it really is a frustration. It used to be three weeks. Now it can take three weeks to nine months. So it's it really, so, and the reason why I'm glad that you asked me that question, because so often it happens that somebody phones me on a, on a Sunday uh, afternoon and say, look, I've just in the process of signing a contract for this property, I need a trust urgently. There is no such thing as a trust urgently. <laughs> and I tell you this now because yeah. people are going to find me and tell me they need it urgently. It doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't, yeah, unfortunately, I've got no control over that process. So rather uh, be conscientious about it, set up the entities, and when you want to enter into the transactions, then you know these entities are available for you to do so. So, yeah. um, and the thing is, that it's, it's not rocket science. From experience in the fiduciary industry, we know this is how the model works. You don't have to go reinvent the wheel again. So if you know that you are going to commit to this business model, then that is how you run the business model. So um, it's just getting your ducks in a row. Um, and you know, um, the other thing I can just mention is that people say, like you mentioned it with, with, the, with the trust resolution, to me, that is normally an indication of how dedicated the person is to the business model. Because if they can't even keep a proper paper trial, which I normally do on behalf of the client, if they can't commit to that legal process, then how on earth are you going to commit to accumulate billions of rands in a legal entity? So it's a small thing. You must remember that if you want to accumulate wealth, it comes with responsibility. So, and one of those responsibilities is to act as a trustee and to have your paper trial in place. And it's a simple thing. It's not that you have to go study law or whatever the case may be. It's a simple thing. Just have your paper trail in place and number them from number one until um, indefinite. Um, but if you can't commit to at least managing the business in a proper sound way, then I would really recommend that you look at another business because, I mean, every business has got requires a commitment and um, responsibility from, uh, from the incumbent. So um, that to me is quite important, yes. Yeah. I think uh, everybody, you know, in the beginning as well, before I knew sort of what I was doing, it's like, yeah, it's easy to open a company. 
um, but you don't realize the the, the amount of admin and reporting yes. and whatever that goes yes. on in the background. It's like, yeah, it, it can catch up to you very, very quickly. Um, and the same, yes. same with the trust, really. Yes, All exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Then I think let's uh, look at some of the comments that uh, came through. I think we're going to take, uh, so for everybody that's on this call here or on the on this live, um, we can go into Zoom. I'm just going to cover one or two of these questions, which I think are, are more general. And then the rest of the questions we can do in the backstage area. And Thomas will, okay, cool. will go into there. And we can do the Zoom one as well. Yes. Um, right. So I want to quickly uh, cover two of these, these general ones. Um, and the one is around, you know, so it looks like there's some people that have set up a trust already, but they might want to make changes. How do how would one go about making a change either to beneficiaries or to mm. uh, the purpose of the trust? Because some trust you can say, oh, the purpose of this trust, and you make it very narrow and specific. It's just to buy property, buy an old properties, and you forgot mm. to put sell properties as well. How mm. do you go about changing? And what are there certain things that are easier to change than other things? What's the risk around that? The process? Yeah. How do you change information? Yeah, listen. Um I'm in, uh, I'm in the final stages of being admitted as advocate, so I know how to give the correct legal answer to this and not um, <laughs> have any li legal liability in, uh, in my name. Yeah, so look, the, the best thing is that if you send me the, the trust deed and we have a consultation about that, I can't give blanket advice as far as that is concerned. Okay. So the best is if, the, if so the person contacts me, they send me uh, the copy of the trust deed and I can ask them, what do you want to change? Because you must... You must remember that a trust deed is not something uh, mystical. It's a contract. So there's hundreds of contracts out there. So I, I cannot give blanket advice in terms of, of, uh, of a contract. So I would need to have the contract first and look at the contract. What does the contract stipulate about that particular change? And then I can consult with the client and tell them, look, this is, this is what you can do and this is what you can't do. So yes, um, you can change. You, you can actually amend the whole trust deed. So uh, we adopt a resolution if, if, if it's drafted in such a way uh, we can amend the complete uh, uh, trust deed and replace it by another trust deed. So you can, so there's nothing that you cannot change. I would, however, not change the beneficiaries of the trust because even though the beneficiaries of trusts um, doesn't have a vested interest, they do have a hope, which means that if you change their hope, they would have uh, a legal jurisdiction to start litigation as far as that is concerned. It doesn't mean that yeah. you have vested interest, but they've got a hope that can be affected, yes. Yeah, except if it's just your kids and their babies and it doesn't matter. <laughs> yes, exactly. But again, that yeah. comes back to your personal situation and um, yeah, and, and what is the, who and what is in that mentioned in that trust. And then obviously, exactly. yeah, all right. Okay, cool. Um, and I think the other one is around at what point do you decide to do so you have a property trust, okay? And in yes. there, you've got two or three or four properties. At what point do you decide that, okay, well, I, I actually need another trust? Or can no. you just put everything into this one trust? Is no, no, there no, no, a no. Yeah. or is it the yes. personal yeah. thing? Yeah, you see, the thing is, um, uh, once again, I would have to look at that trust deed, but normally a trust deed allows to, to, uh, to set up another trust from the original trust. So what will happen is the trustees will get together, they will adopt a resolution stating that we as trustees hereby, in terms of clause A3 of the trustee, decide to set up another trust, which will basically be your private trust, your cash trust. Um, and the reason why, um, so you can do that at any stage, it's, it's actually when a need arises. But one, one really important thing, and I didn't want to touch on that in my presentation because I didn't want to, uh, I, uh, it, it, it's, it's part of the property in the trust uh, concept, but uh, it's 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 really a total different topic. So what I normally recommend, what I've done in the past as well, is that I don't pay off my properties in the trust. I, I try to gear them as neutral as possible. In other words, I look at what is my rental income versus my bond payments, and I always try to keep that the same. So the moment you reach that mo neutral gearing point, I take the extra cash out of the property, uh, I refinance the property and take the cash out, and that cash goes to my private trust, which is free from any claims by any creditors. Mm -hmm. So that 
money in the private trust. I can in, invest in Alan Gray uh, and grow more wealth on that property. If the money stayed in the property, in the bond, um, I normally use this example of if a property is worth a million rand and it's paid off, you don't grow on two million rand just because the property is paid off. You only still grow on a million rand. So why leave cash in the property? It doesn't make sense. You must take out that cash and use that to acquire more cylinders in the trust, either invest it in cash or use it as deposits on more investment properties. So I wouldn't leave, I wouldn't pay off properties at all. Um, uh, um, uh, somebody I really respect, Anna Australia, says the same thing, that you must always try and use a bank's money to grow. So the, the moment there's money lying in a bond, it's dead money. That money is not growing. You still only grow on the capital value of the property, regardless whether it's paid off or not. So, so in that, the reason why I mentioned that, because that's why the private trust makes sense, so that you can park that cash in the private trust free from, from any claims, but also um, you can transfer that money back into the private trust if you want to use it uh, for deposits on more investment properties. So, um, so the money is parked in the private trust and it can grow in terms of your investment uh, vehicles, but you can transfer the money back into the private trust as a deposit on another investment property. Yeah, and I think also if you're going to do something that's a bit risky, that you think, yes. oh, this property, is it going to work, is it not going to work, but I'm going to take a chance because I believe in it. If, if you think it's a little bit risky, don't mix it with your other stuff. Absolutely. Keep it, keep it yeah. outside, completely by itself, in its own entity, its own thing. Don't mix it with your normal Absolutely. property. Absolutely, yeah. You know, I like to, I like to yeah. go and uh, do a property, stabilize it, so now I know, okay, even before you can buy, you it transfers, you can stabilize something. Yes. So make sure that you stabilize what you have and then yes. put it together with the rest absolutely. of your, your properties. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the thing is, um, I've also seen in practice how people use trust uh, in terms of forming a partnership with other people in terms of investment. So your private trust um, uh, is linked to another private trust where somebody, a, a group of investors get together to buy a particular property for long-term keep. I'm not talking about speculation. Mm -hmm. So that's why I love the trust vehicle because it's so compatible. So um, it's it's less stringent than a company, um, but um, it, the, the applications of the trust is basically uh, 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 infinite. Um, uh, it's not as limited as the company itself, yes. Yeah. I mean, we also um, like using trusts for um, for our almost like uh, for our investors as well. We have, yes. uh, and if you guys have, if if you guys don't know by now, Sakisizwe Property Stockfell has a trust, Sakisizwe Property Trust, where uh, they are purchasing properties and they are uh, purchasing it in the trust. Um, and that first property, they're busy going through the process now of um, uh, the, the, the purchase price has been paid. They're going through the motions now of actually um, registering the, the property. And um, the nice thing there as well is that we have many, many people that can come in, invest money. It goes into the trust. All the compliance that is required by law must be there. All the resolutions must be there. Everything must be there. So it's a very transparent vehicle as well for people yes, to put yeah. money in. Yeah. yeah. So and um, and by your knowledge. <laughs> I wonder who taught me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Thomas, yeah. for teaching that up and teaching us, being yeah, our absolutely. coach, I think. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I think that's the amazing thing of, of my um, career um, I remember in Sandton, um, uh, people who were directors of a private bank, they sold the bank to another uh, conglomerate and we had, had to help them invest the money. And at the first uh, appointment, they knew nothing about trust. A year later, they were conducting the interviews for uh, referrals. And I was just sitting there saying nothing because they knew everything. So and, <laughs> uh, it's just through exposure that, that, that you basically learn these things. It's not complicated at all. Yes. Yeah, by doing, I always, I'm a big believer, by doing something, you learn how to do it. Yes, so, absolutely. So, yeah. gather as much knowledge, uh, just being here today is already gathering knowledge into, um, yeah. into, the, yeah. into how to do it and then do it and, and yeah. go through the yeah. process. Yeah, listen, uh, uh, and, and that's why I'm really nervous about somebody, somebody 
ask you a blanket question, should I use a company or a trust for property? I say, why are you asking me this question? It's, 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 it's about a practical application. There's no vanilla flavor answer to anything. Life is too complicated. So when you look at a particular property and you see what risks are involved with the property and what you do with it, then you decide what to do in, in terms of the legal entity. You can't ask that question before you've identified the property because like, like you mentioned, if you buy a high risk property, then you would uh, already naturally answer the question into which entity that goes. So, um, so yeah, it, it, it really is, it, it's very practical um, indeed. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. I think we are at 11 o'clock on top of the hour. So everybody that uh, has your Zoom links, which you should have uh, uh, received in your email, um, yeah, let's go into into the Zoom session. Tom, uh, soon to be, can I say, maybe not yet, but Professor Thomas, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. For, it's an for absolute pleasure. And listen, I must really recommend you, I must really recommend you what, what, what you're doing for the public uh, in general, Albe. Uh, the, uh, the assistance and the, the practicality of what you do is absolutely phenomenal. And it's really a privilege and an honor to, uh, to be associated with you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for that, for those kind of words. <laughs> right. All right. Thanks, Arisa, guys. Would you just, would you just yeah. give me the Zoom link? Yeah, I haven't I seen will. the Zoom link yet. Thank I you so much. I will send that to you now, so you can join us there. Um, and then for everybody else, if you would like um, to get Thomas's details, to do your trust or have a consultation one-on-one -on -one with him, the link will be in the in the description of the video. So go and, and have a look on at those links. And then obviously, you know where to find us. So you're also welcome to ask us. Great, guys. Yes. See you at 3 o'clock. Cheers. Bye.